I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to the 14th chapter of the book of Acts. <clears throat> and let's talk about uh, having the right stuff. Uh, on the screen is uh, a picture of the um, shuttle as it uh, takes off. <clears throat> but most of you are old enough to remember uh, uh, this one. Uh, I'm not much of a movie goer. Um, but in 1983, uh, this uh, movie came out called the, the Right Stuff. And it was about the uh, seven astronauts uh, of the Mercury uh, mission that went up and that they, they had the, the right stuff. But I want you to listen uh, just a, a little clip of some of the, the right stuff that they, they thought they had. America's Mercury astronauts! Seven men who would risk their lives in a hurtling piece of machinery to cross the threshold of space. It takes a special kind of man to volunteer for a suicide mission, especially once on TV. You know, the government spends just all kinds of time and money teaching you pilots how to be fearless. They were idolized by the public. They were human beings. Human beings with real fears. If anybody goes up, then the thing's going to be spam in a can. And I just kind of cut it off there because it j I just wanted you to see that these guys, um, it was just kind of a takeoff of the guys, but there were people that did die when they went up there, uh, and it was a difficult time for them. Why or what did they have that was the right stuff. I would suggest to you that what they had was that they were willing to, to lay it all down for the cause. That's really what kind of pulled them through at that moment with, with the right stuff. Because they were willing to say, okay, everything's on the line. If, if I go, I go. They kind of had this right stuff now for a moment, let me ask you this. Paul and Barnabas were the two men that God said, okay, we're going to launch the church. Not some uh, space vehicle, but the church, his church. And he said, uh, Paul and Barnabas, you're the two. We're going to send you on the very first missionary trip. Now for a moment, let's take Paul and and Barnabas out of the picture. And let me ask you what that church launch would have looked like if you had been one of the two. And instead of Paul and Barnabas, it was uh, Justin and Dave. Would the church have been launched if it had been you instead of Paul and Barnabas? Do you have the right stuff? Now, we can't go back. We're not a time machine. We can't go back and, and relive those moments. But today, there's still a need to share in the same way they did about, a, about the Lord with other people. And I'm just wondering if, if you have the right stuff. Let's go back to where we were a couple of weeks or a month or so ago. These are the uh, cities, the red dots, are the cities and locations in Acts chapter 13. There's a little island right out in the Mediterranean here. It's the Cyprus uh, island, and it has kind of a little pointer, almost like a little hand, just pointing up in that direction. See that, that pointer right there? And I wanted just to say that it's pointing right to the place where Paul and Barnabas started their first missionary journey ever. And that location, that first red dot to the left there, is Syrian Antioch. The reason I put Syrian Antioch there is because as people started, as great leaders started different cities, or as different cities sp sprung up here and there and, uh, and everywhere, somebody say, let's call it Antioch. After this guy. And so there's an Antioch here where they started. And then the very top dot in about the middle of the screen is also Antioch. And it's in a region called Pisidia. 
So it's known as Pisidian Antioch. So once in a while in Scripture when you read, and they went to Antioch, and over in Antioch they did this, and you say, which Antioch is it? And if I could carry the same theme with these, the, sh the space shuttles, you know, the right stuff, it, we had Cape Kennedy, or Cape Canaveral, and then it was Cape Kennedy, and now it's either one, whichever one you want to kind of call it. Because you say, well, is that the same place, Cape Kennedy? And when they changed the name to Cape Canaveral and going back and forth, in Scripture they had several of those places too. So they started out in Antioch. And they left that far right dot and went to the closest one next to it, which is just uh, about 15 miles away, to Seleucia, right on the coast there. Then they sailed across the Mediterranean there to Cyprus, to Salamis, crossed the island to Paphos, then turned north and went to Perga in Pamphylia, and then ended in chapter 13 anyway, Acts chapter 13, in Pisidian Antioch. <clears throat> Let me take that away for a moment and just put the letter C over that and that can kind of let you know when you look at the missionary journeys, you say, okay, the first missionary journey, if I just made that big letter C, I can cover almost every area they went. I guess I could have made the C larger and, and covered this one as well. But just so you remember the C, let me use the word called because Paul and Barnabas were called to do the work of this, of this ministry. You see that in Acts chapter 13, verses 2 and 3. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have what? I've called them. So just keep that in mind. First missionary journey, they were called to go there. Let's go back to the globe again. Let's zero in on these areas, and I want, us, I want you to see it from a kind of a land perspective. Let's fly in on the area. This is Antioch, and they went right to the coast to Seleucia, sailed across to Salamis and Cyprus and Paphos, then turned north, came right up through here, and into Perga and Pamphylia. Then the mountain range right here is the Taurus Mountains. They went over the Taurus Mountains and ended right up in here in Pisidian Antioch. And again, that's chapter 13. They're having a great time, Paul and Barnabas. John Mark left them, you'll recall, Barnabas' uh, nephew. And here's what was going on, Acts 13, 49. The word of the Lord spread. And they're just a great time. They were so excited. People were getting saved. They were preaching the gospel. But anytime God's word starts to spread, there's always opposition. This is verse 49, chapter 13. But look at verse 50. It says this. But the Jews incited the God-fearing women of high standing and the leading men of the city. They stirred up persecution against Paul and Barnabas and expelled them from the region. But Paul and Barnabas are saying, wow, the Lord's using us. But persecution is there. This is verse 50. Look at verse 51. So they shook the dust from their feet in protest against them and went to Iconium. And the disciples were filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. Let's see. Your life is threatened and you've just been expelled from one area and you're going, yes, oh, this is great. We're having a wonderful time. Why? Because they had the right stuff. It just amazes me when uh, years back when the B-2 pilots were, it was, it was the big thing on the B-2 pilots, uh, I was leading a Bible study with a group of the B-2 pilots and their wives at the base. And so some of the guys were coming in and they would come to church and, and then they'd want to play racquetball and, and beat us up. Remember that, Steve? Because yeah. they were guys that were going to not only be the B-2 pilots, but they wanted to be the astronauts. And some of them went on to, to be at NASA and to help out in those kind of programs because they, they'd had the right stuff they could handle this kind of beaten up stuff. So they move on to Iconium. This is the end of chapter 13. So let's go back to the globe. And I just want you to make sure where Iconium is in relation to Antioch. Here's Antioch in the far uh, northwest. Uh, Iconium uh, 
They go from Antioch to Iconium to Lystra over to Derby. But right now, they end chapter 13 in Iconium and begin chapter 14 at Iconium. So chapter 14 says this, At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. Because whenever God's at work, Satan says, oh, i got to stop that. God's at work in chapter 13, persecution. The end of chapter 13. God's at work at the beginning of chapter 14. What happens? Let's stir things up. Let's create problems. God's at work in your family, perhaps, and Satan's wanting to stir things up. God's at work in your life, and, and sometimes Satan says, well, let's get the kids all stirred up. Sometimes God's at work in the kid's life, and the parents get all stirred up. God's at work in your family, and then at work, everything gets stirred up. Just remember, uh, when God's at work, Satan doesn't sit still. They poisoned the brothers against them. So what was the right stuff the Mercury astronauts had? They were willing to do what? Lay it all down. Just lay it all down. Paul and Barnabas were willing to do what? Lay it all down. How does chapter 13 end? Persecution. Trials. How does chapter 14 begin? Stirring it up. Trials. Here's the question I have for you. Do you have the right stuff in order for God to use you to build his church today. Take Paul and Barnabas out. You're in their place. What's getting accomplished? Do you have that right kind of stuff? I would say to you, look, there, there's several ingredients. If somebody's going to make a, uh, a pie, it takes several ingredients. If you're going to serve God in his church, it's going to take more than just one thing. So let me give you the first ingredients. First, they spoke boldly for the Lord. They could just speak out for the Lord. Let me uh, take you to the text. Acts 14, 1. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. Now, I'll say it this way. You say they spoke how? Effectively. And I can hear you say, I'm not an effective speaker. So I guess I don't have the right stuff. I just want you to know that he qualifies this. He really tells us what was going on later in the text. But it wasn't that they were so articulate. It wasn't like, wow, these guys have had every course in public speaking. Wow, the words, they are so articulate that all their words just cascade from their lips in such great oratory skill that everybody says, oh, I need what they have. They had effective speech, but they weren't trained great orators. Someone has said that the, the most fearful thing for people today is if they have to get up and speak in front of other people. If we just say, okay, your turn. Come on up. Give a speech. Even when I was in college, I did my first speech class, I thought, I don't, I don't want to speak. And so the, the prof asked the question of, of who's had a speech class already? Who's already taken speech in high school or had a speech class? And, and, and I thought, oh, good. Then they'll go first because they've already had it. And then he kind of reversed it and he said, okay, all those of you who have it in speech class, you're giving the first speech. And I thought, oh, man, I, I thought I was getting out of it by not having a speech class. And then he said, I tell you what, though, here's what you're going to do. You're not going to speak on your first speech. You're just going to do a pantomime. Now, that's a little better. But when it came time, I was still sweating bullets. <laughs> I thought, oh, man, I got to get up there in front of people. And everybody's going to be looking. They're going to be looking at me. But why is that that you... So 
they're speaking. At Iconium, Paul and Barnabas went as usual into the Jewish synagogue. There they spoke so effectively that a great number of Jews and Gentiles believed. But the Jews who refused to believe stirred up the Gentiles and poisoned their minds against the brothers. So Paul and Barnabas spent considerable time there doing what? Speaking boldly for the Lord. Here's the uh, Greek word that's used in this text, peresiadzomai. It means to speak freely or boldly. Why is it sometimes when uh, some parents bring and they have little kids, and I, and I get down on my knee, I'll get down and say, hey, how are you? And then they go, they, I'll get over here where, I can see where you can see. They, they just go, and they kind of close down, and, and they don't say anything. And then a the parent probably says something like, oh, they're a little what? Shy. <coughs> but you get them at home. <laughs> they're all over the map. They can speak, and it's not a problem. Sometimes I'll say to somebody, oh, you know, she's, she's pretty quiet. Then they're looking at you like, you know who I, you don't know her, do you? <laughs> Man, she's, she, you can't shut her up when she's, once she gets to what? Know you. Once she gets to, then, because at that point she can what? Speak what? Freely and boldly. Even your little kids. How do they speak to you as parents? They're not afraid to tell you what's going on. The older they get, the more they're not afraid to tell you. But when somebody else says something to them, somebody else can tell them to sit down and be quiet. And what do they do? Sit down and be quiet. You tell them to sit down and be quiet, and they say, who left you in charge? <laughs> because they, they get so familiar that they speak boldly and freely. These two men were able to speak what? Boldly for the Lord. Let me show you where this is used in, in Scripture. Acts chapter 9, verse 27, it says it this way. Paul had just gotten saved and nobody wanted anything to do with him because he used to kill people. He used to kill Christians, imprison people. So when somebody became a Christian, they said, man, I'm not going to have anything to do with him. But Barnabas took him. He said, okay, you can come with me. Barnabas was a real trustworthy guy. Barnabas, said, Barnabas took him, brought him to the apostles, he told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus, Paul, or Saul, because his name got changed, Saul had preached how? Fearlessly in the name of the Lord. Once his life was changed, he could speak how? Fearlessly. Same Greek word here, fearlessly or boldly for the Lord. This is Acts 9.27. And just so you don't miss it, Acts 9, 28 uses the next, the same time, uh, the next Greek word the same time. For Saul, so Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking how? Boldly in the name of the Lord. Twice, back to back. How does he speak? Boldly. By the time you get to chapter 13 and verse 46, it says this. When Paul and Barnabas, then Paul and Barnabas answered them how? Boldly. Let me show you. Here are all the times that this Greek word is used just in the book of Acts. It's used more in the book of Acts than any other book in Scripture. Because those people had a what? A boldness for the Lord. But I don't want you to miss, they weren't trained, articulate speakers. They relied on something else. And Paul writes about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 4, where he says, My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with a demonstration of what? The Spirit's power. They were able to have a boldness because they had someone inside them, the Holy Spirit. And so they could speak for the Lord. So I know from this passage that Acts chapter 14, verse 1, when they spoke so uh, convincingly that people trusted the Lord, it wasn't, what, it wasn't them that drew them to the Lord. It was the Holy Spirit in them that kept drawing them to the Lord. 
The boldness came from the Spirit. And when do you get the Spirit? You get the Spirit when you trust the Lord. He gives you the Spirit as the seal that you're saved. He's the earnest deposit. Some of you have bought a home before and they say, how about, do you have any earnest money you want to put down? The earnest money says, I'm sincere about this. I am earnestly going to buy this house. It's called then earnest money because you're going to perform. God said he gives the Holy Spirit to everyone that trusts him as the earnest deposit, the guarantee that he's going to do stuff in your heart and life. The question is whether you're letting the Holy Spirit reign in your life. If the Holy Spirit's reigning in your life, you'll have a new boldness. Because you're, what's the worst people can say to you anyway? I'm not interested. Quit talking about Jesus. Is that going to hurt you? If you tell them, and they talk about some problems in their life, and you say, yeah, yeah, I, I was through something like that. And you know what it did? It drove, it drove me to, to recognize that God can take control of those things. And, and you just take their problems and talk about how God led those problems in your life to the Lord. And you just share your testimony. Why can't you be bold just telling what happened in your life? How can they argue with that? It happened to you. You were this way and now you're this way. You were headed that way and now you're headed this way. 180 degrees. And you can just speak boldly about that. See, the problem we often have is we think it's our job to convince people that they need to get saved. That's not our job. Our job is to share what happened in our lives and how he made that possible. And then let God do the work in their hearts and lives. The problem we have is we think we need to be like salesmen and get them to, to buy the product. We don't. As a matter of fact, when we do that, I'm almost convinced that people don't get saved because they have no conviction of sin. They just invite Jesus in their life to get you off their back. And so you'll shut up. But if you let the Holy Spirit do the convicting, then when they're ready, they want the Lord. What do they have? They had a boldness. The question I have for you, we remove Paul, we remove Barnabas, we put you in there. What does the church launch look like then? Do you have the right stuff? Do you have the ingredients? Do you speak boldly for the Lord? Let me give you a second ingredient they had. The second one was this. They refused to take any glory for what God was doing through them. See, there are some people that say, man, I did this, and I did that, and they, they want all the glory. So here's what happens in the text. They're in Iconium. This is the beginning of chapter 14. Verses 1 through 7, they're ministering in Iconium and God seems that God is doing the work there. So much so that the word of God is spreading and people are starting to persecute them again. So they're going to leave Iconium. Look at this green. They're going to leave Iconium and go down to Lystra. It's only 18 miles. Here to what? Rosamond? About that? I should have asked Pastor Gary the last hour. He lives in Rosamond. Anybody live in Rosamond? How 18 miles? Rosamond. Okay. Here to Rosamond. They're going to leave Iconium and, and go down to Lystra. Here's what's going on by the time you get to chapter 14, verse 8. In Lystra, there sat a man crippled in his feet who was lame from birth and had never walked. Does this sound familiar? In Acts chapter 3, Peter was walking with John, and they came across a lame man. And the lame man was asking for money. And Peter looked at him and said, Silver and gold have I none, but such as I have give I thee. In the name of Christ, in the name of Jesus Christ, get up and walk. And the man started walking. And he went walking and leaping and praising God. It was Peter who did it in Acts chapter 3. Now it's Paul in Acts chapter 14. Both the men crippled all their lives. Do you understand when the, the wonderful thing about miracles in Scripture is they were all miracles that would have been impossible. They weren't like, 
oh, I got a back pain, and let's just pray that Jesus heals that. Jesus does. He's interested in your back pain, and he can heal that. But in order to really show the miracles, when Jesus healed people, they were people that for 38 years hadn't walked. They were people that were blind, and he gave them sight. They were people who were dead for more than four days, like Lazarus. And in the tomb already. Haven't eaten, haven't had anything to drink. They're dead. And that's why when they got to Lazarus they, and he was going to re resurrect him, they said, oh, Lord, by this time he stinks. He started to decompose. Jesus did these miracles that were impossible to do. They weren't just psychosomatic sicknesses. They were dead. They were blind. They were crippled for life. In Lystra, there sat a man crippled in his feet who was lame from birth and had never walked. He listened to Paul as he was speaking. Paul looked directly at him, saw that he had faith to be healed and called out, stand up on your feet. At that, the man jumped up and began to walk. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. I just want you to understand, Paul didn't speak the Lyconian language. He could speak Hebrew. He could speak Greek. That was the modern language of that day. And so when he was traveling, they were speaking that Koine Greek language. So the man is healed and he's starting to walk and he's been lame all his life. And they start to say in their language, these are gods. The gods have come down to us. And Paul and Barnabas are going, they're just smiling. They think these people, because these people are probably raising their hands. and Oh, the gods have come down to us. And they're saying in their language, and Paul and Barnabas are just smiling, because they don't have a clue what's going on. Until all of a sudden, the priest of Zeus shows up with the bulls, and they're going to start sacrificing them to Paul and Barnabas. Because their gods come down in human form. Here's what the text says. When the crowd saw what Paul had done, they shouted in the Lyconian language, the gods have come down to us in human form. Barnabas they called Zeus. And Paul they called Hermes because he was the chief speaker. The priest of Zeus, whose temple was just outside the city, brought bulls and wreaths to the city gates because he... And the crowd wanted to offer sacrifices to them. So they're just happy as can be. God's at work. God's done a miracle. People are starting to get saved. But then others are, and they're looking, and the bulls show up, and the priest of Zeus shows up, and, and they're going, oh, what's, wait a minute, what's going on here? And then they start to put together what's happening. Verse 14. But when the apostles, Barnabas and Paul, heard of this, they tore their clothes and rushed out into the crowd shouting, Men, why are you doing this? We too are only men, human like you. We're not gods. We cannot take any glory, any credit, any praise for what God has done. It goes on. In the past, they said to the Lyconian people, in the past, God let all nations go their own way. Yet he has not left himself without testimony. He has shown kindness by giving you rain from heaven and crops in their seasons. He provides you with plenty of food and fills your hearts with joy. Even with these words, they had difficulty keeping the crowds from sacrificing to them. They're saying, don't do this. It's God alone who gives you rain. It's God alone who gives you food. It's God alone who gives you the kindness. And we're just mere what? Men. Don't do this. They said, we're not going to take the credit. We're not going to take the praise. We're not going to take the glory. Because only God gets the glory. That's how he says it in, in uh, Isaiah chapter 42, verse 8. I am the Lord, that is my name. I will not give my glory to another or my praise to idols. That's why when we sing and worship here, we say we have an audience of how many? 
One, you're not the audience. The worship team is not the audience. The worship team is not here to entertain you. You are not here to sing to us. We have an audience of one, the God of the universe, and we're to glory and praise his name. And what they learned is, look, they had the right stuff. Do you have the right stuff? They had the ingredients that it took to give God all the glory. First, they spoke boldly. Secondly, they refused to take the glory that was only God's. Let me give you a third ingredient they had. They never gave up. They never gave up. Here's what the text says. Verse 5, there was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and Jews together with their leaders to mistreat them, that's Paul and Barnabas, and to do what? Stone them. Now, in verses 1 through 7, they're in Iconium. Verses 8 and on, they move to Lystra. They're threatening to stone them in Iconium. So they leave Iconium and go to Lystra, and you know what happens to Paul and Lystra? They stone him. They threaten to do it in Iconium. They do it in Lystra. Because he had the right stuff. He was willing to lay it all what? Lay it all down. So there was a plot afoot among the Gentiles and the Jews uh, together with their leaders to mistreat them and stone them. But they found out about it and fled to the Lyconian cities of Lystra and Derbe and to the surrounding country where they shut their mouths. <laughs> They just continued. They never gave up. Just talk, 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 talk. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Threatened to stone him. They still kept, he still continued to talk about Jesus. By the time you get to verse 19, here's what it said. Then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. Let's go back to the globe for a second so you just know where they are. They came from Antioch and Iconium. Here's Antioch and Iconium on the screen. They've already, remember they, chapter 13 ends with them in Antioch. Or ends with them on their way to Iconium. Chapter 14 begins. At Iconium, here's what they did. Seven verses, they're in Iconium. Then they get threatened to be stoned, so they leave Iconium and go where? To Lystra. So on the screen, here's Antioch and Iconium. And what I just read to you is while they're in Lystra, some people come from Antioch and Iconium and stir up the crowd to get after Paul and Barnabas. And just so you understand, look at Antioch here. Antioch to Lystra is nearly 100 miles. And it's 100 miles walking and Jews came from Antioch and Iconium to Lystra and stirred up the crowd this is how serious they were we're going to stop Paul and Barnabas and it wasn't just 100 miles because they had to go 100 miles there and 100 miles back 200 miles just so they could stone this guy the text goes on then some Jews came from Antioch and Iconium and won the crowd over. They stoned Paul and dragged him outside the city thinking he was dead. But after the disciples had gathered around him, he got up and da 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 You know, can you see? It's got like the phoenix coming up out of the ashes. And he goes back into the city. Can you imagine the people that just stoned him the day before? Dragged his body out. Say, what, you know, think what he might look like. They just pummeled him with stones down in the pit, dragged him out of the city, left him for dead, and he's coming back in. And he's going to continue to do what? Tell them about Jesus. They're thinking, I mean, I can't imagine what they would think. They've just taken him down the day before. They've just given him the best shot they had. And he's da 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 and right back into the city, never quitting, never giving up, right back in. He goes on, 
Verse 20, the next day he and Barnabas left for Derby. They preached the good news in that city and won a large number of disciples. Then they returned to Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, the same places where all the people were before, just right back into the fray. They had the right stuff. I'm just asking, why, what was the right stuff here? They didn't what? They didn't give up. Some of you at times are thinking, uh, I guess, you know, it's not going to work. My mom's not going to trust the Lord. My dad's not going to trust the Lord. My kids aren't going to trust the Lord. So-and-so's not going to trust the Lord. I keep sharing the Lord with them. I'm saying, they had the right stuff. They didn't give up. Look, just because you share the Lord with somebody the first time, they, go, they don't go, wow, you know, smack yourself on the head, head and go, wow, I should have had a V8. You know? they, it's not the first, you know, it's not just one time and they think that, that this is going to happen. They want to see you changed and in the power of the Lord. And God wants them to know that there's hope. And then he lets them go to the mat again. And they're down on the mat going, uncle, uncle, okay, Lord. And once they have had enough, they say, okay, Lord, I'm ready. And it's not something new to them. You know, I tell our, our staff and our elders all the time, when we meet as elders, it usually takes six times at a minimum for people to receive a new idea. That's why so many pastors get so discouraged sometimes because they, they dream about these ideas and, well, oh, they're going to do this for the church and do this for the church and do this for the church. And they go to present it to the board and the board says, no, nope, not going to happen. And then they get so discouraged. They just need to realize that you need to give other people time to catch up with your ideas. So when your kids, you need to tell them. And then you correct them. Then you tell them. Then you correct them. And you tell them and tell them. And then you correct them and correct them. And then you tell them. How many times? About six times before they get. <laughs> or seven or eight or it may take longer. But it, how many, when you tell your kid the very first time, they get it. From that point on, they never do it wrong again. Paul just kept, don't give up. You know this guy, Winston Churchill? He, is, he had some of the craziest, funniest statements at times. Some of them I, I don't even want to repeat. But he said, uh, you know, you know when you're... Uh, when you're a politician, when you can see into the future, a year, five years, ten years, and you, you tell them what's, what's going to happen, so they vote you in because you're a great politician. And, you know, you're really a politician at the end of the ten years when you can explain them why it didn't happen, like you told them it was going to happen. Because <laughs> that's a good politician. But here's a statement he made when he went back to his, his boyhood school. He wanted to go back and sing some of the songs and be at his school. They even, they even took one of the songs and made one of the verses just for him. And then he's speaking to the kids. Just a short, just a short speech. Probably in three or four minutes, maybe five at the most, uh, at the very most. You can see it online. But here's one part of that speech. He says, never give in, never give in, never, 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 never in nothing. Great or small, large or petty, never give in except to convictions of honor and good sense. Never yield to the apparently overwhelming might of the enemy. Now, he never even claimed to be a Christian as far as I know. But this is great godly advice. Never give in to the enemy. Never stop. It's easy to quit. It'd be real easy to quit. I said in the last service when I was uh, at, at MBI, I sold Bibles in the summertime just like, just like Tim did. So we were door to door selling Naves Topical Bibles. And so you go to the training, uh, they, they sign you up to work for the summer. They said, okay, if you're going to do this job, you've got to work 75 hours a week. I said, give me that pen. <laughs> I can work 75 hours a week. And so 
they get on, you train you in, in Tennessee, and then they tell you where you're going to be for the summer. I was in Columbus, Ohio for the summer. There were six of us that started out in Columbus, Ohio, three of us at one house and three of us at another house. I didn't do well the first week. I sold 125 or something like that, dollars worth of books, so nothing. And uh, the other guys did, did a little better. One of my roommates did so well, he decided to order more Bibles so he'd have enough to last him all summer. By the end of the third week, I come back to the, the house. I looked at my bed and there was a letter. I thought, how did this get here? No stamp on it, just my name on it. I opened it up. It's a letter from him. I quit. I called Spence. Spence said, transfer all your books over to me. I'm thinking, oh my goodness. Now I got all my books to sell and all his books and the additional books he, he ordered. I think, oh. And about halfway through the summer, I leave the house uh, Monday morning and, and I was in the car and all of a sudden I'm driving and I, I start to black out a little bit. So I pull over on the side of the road. I thought, wow, what's going on? I better go back to the house. I don't know what's going on. I get back to the house. I get to the doctor. I, I, I had gotten the mumps. So here I am, about 20 years of age. I forget, 21. And I got the mumps and I'm there for the week. I call my parents. They're in New York. I'm in Ohio. My dad says, ah, quit that job. Just come on home. I said, I can't, Dad. I signed. I, I promised. I gave my word. Would it be easy to quit? Yeah. But you're setting an example for your kids. Never give up. Never give up. Give them the opportunity to finish a task. Make it small enough that they can complete it. Never give up. But when it comes to the Lord, never give up. Until they're dead, there's hope for salvation. Never give up. Look, do you have the right stuff? What are the ingredients? <clears throat> they spoke boldly. They refused to take God's glory. They never gave up. Lastly, they discipled others. And I really want to say it that way so you catch it. Here's what the text says. The next day, verse 20, the next day, Paul and Barnabas left for Derby. They preached the good news in that city and won a large number of what kind of people? Disciples. Greek word here looks like this, mathetuo, mathetuo. It's only used four times in the New Testament. Let me throw out something else in here. Let me put these words on the screen. Missions and missionary. Let me say this. These two words never occur in Scripture. We use them all the time. Oh, he's a missionary. And you say, well, I'm not a missionary. No, you're a discipler. You make disciples. And even the most famous passage where Matthew is used, it's only four passages in the New Testament. The one you're most familiar with is Matthew chapter 28, verse 19. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Matthew Make disciples. The command isn't to go. The go, uh, teach, and baptize are all participles that point to making disciples. When I make disciples, what do I do? Sometimes I have to go to them, and I teach them, and we baptize them. People get saved. The command is to make disciples, not to go. We have the idea that somebody's going to be a missionary, they got to go. That's why I said the word missionary isn't even in the Bible. So let's use biblical terms. You're a discipler. The question is, is whether you're a good one or a bad one. Whether you have the right stuff. Jesus disciple people. He's asking us to disciple people. Who are you discipling right now? Did you have the right stuff? When I look at 
at these ingredients. Do you have difficulty speaking boldly for the Lord? Do you sometimes take the credit? Oh, yeah, this happened. Or do you give God the glory? Do you want to give up? These are the things that Paul and Barnabas did. And God used them in a wonderful way. I want to say to you, don't give up on your kids. Don't give up on your parents. Don't give up on... Those are the things that God has laid before you. Never give up. Within the last couple of weeks, I've had people that said, oh, I just want to give up on my kid. I say, don't give up. And just so you know, so the kids know, it was no parent here. <laughs> okay? Your parents aren't giving up on you. Let's ask God to give us these kinds of ingredients so that we end up with the right kind of stuff. Do you, do you have the right kind of stuff? We want our kids to be saved. We want our spouses to be saved. But how about our neighbors? And how about our employees that work with us on the job? Let's ask God to give us the right stuff. Okay, Father, would you just pour into us your Holy Spirit. We know that the Spirit is in us as believers, but would you fill us with your Spirit now that we would be overflowing into the lives of other people. Help us to make disciples. Oh God, we would confess that we don't have the right stuff completely. That's why we come and we call on you to fill us and empower us so that we speak out of boldness for you. Use us this week for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.